I think that the size of the cohort that's reachable in this cycle is just massive. There's so many reasons I'm excited about this particular bull market, and I, I'm really curious to see how this one plays out. Hi everyone, you're watching Stefan Levera Podcast, brought to you by swan.com. Today, my friend Vijay Boyapati rejoins me on the show. Many of you will know him as the author of The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, and he's also working on the team at Swan as part of the Swan Vault team. So today we're talking about how to ride through the Bitcoin bull cycle. So I think there's a lot of really valuable insights in this conversation with VJ around how to ride the bull cycle and some analysis of what's going on of the different dynamics, a bit about hodler psychology, and also VJ also discusses his take on whether Bitcoin is for everyone. And I think you might be surprised. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And I'm sure you'll enjoy this discussion with VJ. VJ, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Stefan. Great to see you again. Yeah, been too long since I had you on the show. Obviously, uh, we got a bull market. It seems like the bull market is upon us. And uh, I thought it would be great to get you on, get some of your insights, look at how you're viewing the market, as well as I think you're, you know, you're more of an old timer. So you have some, I think, advice and insight that you can share for newer listeners and people who are, you know, perhaps this is their first cycle. Um, so, you know, let's just start with a bit of the overview today. You know, as we record this, uh, it's 25th of March, 10 p.m. in Dubai, and it's, you know, Bitcoin is uh, pumping at the moment. It's about $70,000. Um, do you have you any kind of right. overview thoughts on, uh, oh, yeah, you've got the uh, the Block Clock Mini right there. Yeah. <laughs> My first thought is just to savor it because uh, bear markets are long and painful, and depressing and and people seem to forget about bitcoin bull markets are so exciting it seems like everyone is thinking about bitcoin everyone's focused on it the news the media comes out and <clears throat> i have this long thread on twitter about bull markets and and how they play out and one of the things i observe is that the media attention really starts to pick up right around when bitcoin makes a new all-time high that's like uh, sort of, uh, you know, a momentous moment in the bull market that, oh, wow, Bitcoin's not dead. Not only is it not dead, but it's it's overtaken its previous all-time high, which we all said was crazy and irrational. And so the interest comes back. And then <clears throat> that's what I would mark as the beginning of the sort of parabolic move in the bull market. Uh, and, and eventually you get this huge climax of interest and everyone's pouring money into the market uh, and you what what happens is you run out of people who are reachable in the cycle participants who are reachable in the cycle and then you get the inevitable crash uh, and panic um, and then you start the, the bear market phase so I would say you know if to, to give a a baseball analogy we're probably in the third or fourth innings of this bull market so we're you know somewhere in the middle of the bull market I had written on Twitter, I think it was in November, that I, I believed that we had started the bull market. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things about bull markets is they start off kind of slowly. There's this like slow, steady accumulation, uh, and and the price, it, it accumulates slowly because you have this overhang of supply. You have all of these people who bought at prices higher, and they're just looking to get out. They're They're just hoping that the price gets up to, say, 40,000 or 50,000 or 60,000 and when they get whole they get out and so you have this overhang of supply of people who are just looking to get out and I know people unfortunately who think who have thought this way and, and used it as an opportunity to get out of Bitcoin but once you get to the all-time high there really is no more overhang of supply and then you have <clears throat> kind of this open field of price discovery where where the price can really start to go parabolic. Yeah. Now, do you think it is different this time in that we got an all-time high before the halving, whereas traditionally it's come after the halving? What does that portend for us? Does it mean anything or is it just, you know, we're hitting it a bit early this time? Yeah, I, I would say I wouldn't put too much significance on it except to say that the last cycle was a little strange in that uh, it was muted. It what didn't go as high as people thought, uh, even as high as I thought it would. And I think that pent-up 
energy of people who um, had been accumulating Bitcoin and had strong hands kind of transfers forward to the next cycle. Uh, and to me, it reminds me a little bit of the 2017 cycle where we had this really long, painful bear market. Uh, and we we really s- scratched and clawed our way out of that bear market slowly through 2014, 15 and 16. But then you had this huge amount of energy and Bitcoin rocketed you know, 20x uh, in less than a year. So it has those vibes to me. Yeah. And I think, interestingly, I remember writing about this as well, but in 2017, people have this perception of, oh, just 20,000. But actually, it spent 75% of the year under $5,000, and it spent 90% of the year under $10,000. So it's all just that last sort of month where a few months where it really just went from 5k up to like 20k and then you know crashed down afterwards that after that but uh i wonder maybe that's a similar kind of thing where you as you were saying like you get this kind of slow build up and then at the end it just really it kind of goes insane yeah that's absolutely correct that's one of the points i make in my thread on on bull markets is that a lot of the gains and the headline number that comes out of a cycle, like 20,000, really comes in this very short period of time at, at the end of the cycle. So I don't know what this cycle is going to look like, whether we get to, you know, 200, 400, maybe a million. I don't know where, where we get. But it seems very likely that the, 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 the last part will be very concentrated into a small amount of time. So, for instance, we could be... And this is all hypothetical. We could be kind of moving around um, 90,000 to 120,000 for like months this year. And then all of a sudden we go from 120,000 to 250,000 in the last like month. Something like that would not surprise me at all uh, because it is the nature of these parabolic moves that most of the move happens at the end. And it, it is really interesting because later on people think back to the cycle and they think, oh yeah, 20,000 was a high but re- for 2017. But really only very few people participated in that last part of, of the cycle because it, it only took a couple of weeks, I think, to go from 10,000 to 20,000. Yeah. And so the paradoxical thing though is for a newcomer, the time they got interested was when it was close to 20,000 in that example, in the 2017 example. Or the time when the newcomer from the 21 and 22 cycle, the time they got interested was when it was like $60,000. And so from their perspective, it's like, especially for that person who, quote unquote, bought the top of 21, uh, maybe they bought around 60K, let's say. And so they've spent all this time underwater on, on, let's say, on that early buy. Now, of course, if they've been a good, you know, DCA stacking sats, you know they've been accumulating and their average has you know come down because of that because they've been purchasing so you know they're further up in the green by the time we get back up here but it can feel psychologically uh difficult for that person because of how much time they had to spend underwater absolutely it's really hard to feel like you've you've bought something and you're underwater on it and this is why i i say there's an overhang of supply for the people who can survive that and have held through that uh cycle and and hold through to the next cycle they become really strong hands that's my experience uh but i would say probably the majority of people who bought near the end of a cycle are the ones who are desperately hoping that they're made whole and then they they exit yeah i see and so that's like a similar dynamic that i've seen as you as you mentioned the supply overhang and people it's almost like that they've been underwater and now they've finally got a chance to kind of you know come up for air and and sadly they paradoxically again end up counterintuitively they end up selling at one of the worst possible times because it was just about to you know they've just come back into the black or back into the green whatever you're calling it and they're kind of selling off a chunk there and missing out on all the gain that's to come yeah and you know it's an interesting point because i'm not a trader but i will say i be- i do believe that risk adjusted the absolute best trade on bitcoin is just after it clears its all-time high like when it makes a clean break of its all-time high that's when it's really on that's when the parabolic move is about to start 
So, you know, if I was a trader, I would be looking for that as like a four year trade. Every four years, wait till Bitcoin breaks its all time high and then go all in at that point. And like I said, I'm not a trader, I'm not advocating this, but just observationally, this is what I have seen over the, you know, the last four cycles that I've seen, uh, is that that is the perfect moment during, you know, it seems more rational that the best time to accumulate is during the bear market. And if you're DCAing, that's totally fine. But as a trader, it's really, really difficult. There's so much chop in a bear market where it'll go up like, you know, 50%, but then it'll drop 50% and it just chops around and it'll cut, it cuts traders to pieces. Most people who are trading Bitcoin in a bear market get completely wrecked. Um, but the bull market does offer some trading opportunities and probably the best one is the moment when it gets through the all-time high. Yeah, and as you mentioned, and I think um, Thomas Lee, aka Fundstrat, also popularized this uh, this notion of the the best days of the year, right? So he, it's kind of like this idea of time in the market is better than timing the market, and he's saying, look, you don't want to miss those days, and if you're out, you miss if you missed like the te- the ten best days, you missed most of the gain, and so that's why it's so important to just make sure you have an allocation, and obviously you got to be you you got to have confidence and have an amount that you are able to hodl, right? Because if you, I think this is also paradoxically, sometimes people go too hard in a sense, and they try and buy more than they can actually safely hodl because maybe they need that income or they need that money to pay their rent or their bills or whatever, or maybe someone's retired and, you know, it's important to have an amount that you can hodl, you know, I would say minimum four or five years, ideally 10 years is a good hodl period, I would say. But, uh, you know, obviously when someone's new, it's quite confronting to say, hey, you're in this and you've got to hodl for 10 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you can hodl for 10 years, I mean, historically, you've done very, you've done amazingly. Yeah. It, one thing I would say that's interesting about the psychology of this is that people find it easy to hodl when they're in the green. Even if it's that there's no rationality to it, what matters really is the percentage of your portfolio. So, you know, someone who's in the green, who has like what most financial advisors would say is an irrational amount of Bitcoin, like let's say 50 or 60% of their portfolio is Bitcoin. Uh, but the fact that they're in the green makes it easier for them to ho- hodl than someone who has, say, like 2 or 3 or 4% of Bitcoin, but they're in the red and they're like, oh, man, I can't believe I bought Bitcoin and the 7% of my portfolio has now turned into like 3% and I just want to be made whole so I can get out. So it is interesting, the psychology of being in the red or in the green. Um and my other comment about that is I completely agree with what you said. You need to get the right position size. Choose the position size in your portfolio that you can hodl through adversity. For some people, that could be, you know, only 1% or 2%. But for other people, it could be 10 or 20 or, you know, I know people, and I'm sure you do too, who have like 90 plus percent of their assets in Bitcoin. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, people have to decide what's right for them and what what their risk tolerance is. And I think this is a common point, I've made this before as well, is that it's common for people to overstate or overestimate their risk tolerance, right? How much of a drawdown can you withstand? And if you're gonna if you're gonna be if you're gonna be a real hodler, I think you've got to be willing to hodl through an eighty percent drawdown. Now you and I have lived through that, you know, multiple rounds of that, but I think you've got to be ready for that to come in the future as well. Like it, it it's happened before, it could happen again. And I think a common narrative that comes is oh it's the super cycle this time is different we'll never have a big 80 percent drawdown again and you know people were saying that last cycle and i was against it then as well saying <laughs> no guys like be ready for for a drawdown you know um but uh i think that that's that's an important point for people to think about like we might have cycles to come right i think it's I think it's embedded in human nature that we're going to see these cycles because you can't have a steady, predictable uptrend in something because people see that and they're like, oh, that's just going up and up. So I'm going to get involved in it. And people start crowding into the trade. That's when it starts getting parabolic. People get ahead of themselves and then you run out of folks who are willing to participate in the cycle and then you're going to get the crash. I just think it's part of human nature. I I just can't see a situation where an asset goes up steadily, consistently over many, many years and people don't pile into it. Yeah, I think it's like biologically or somehow naturally, we are just naturally momentum traders, right? Like 
if you just kind of think about what most people are doing. They see We're it going up and they, yeah, yeah, we sort of chase that. And, you know, what happens, uh, to your point about how many people are reachable in the cycle, I think that's the important point. Uh, and it's also how many people are reachable and are willing to hodl, right? Um, because, I mean, here's the other point we could make, right? The ETF, now, of course, you and I will tell people, hey, not your keys, not your coins, self-custody is best. But nevertheless, you could argue that the ETF has just blown the door open in terms of how many people are, quote-unquote, accessible, right? Now, hi- historically, maybe we could have said, look, it's easy to just go sign up on an exchange and you know do whatever, buy Bitcoin, whatever. But in practice, what it seems like is a lot of people wanted it to be just a ticker on their stock portfolio app, whether it's Charles Schwab or E-Trade or whatever, and they just need to be able to buy a, a, a ticker that they on a platform that they've already done KYC, they've already done the hurdles. Maybe that's really that was the real game changer with ETFs. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Uh, <clears throat> there's quite a heavy lift to get someone over the line to do KYC and to explain to them what a wallet is and what Bitcoin addresses are. For normies, that's really difficult, uh, especially when you're g- trying to convince them to you know, put in an allocation of one or two percent and then you say, well, you've got to figure out all this other stuff. Uh, But they already have that sunk cost with most people have brokerage accounts. Most investors have a brokerage account. Uh, They've already got the sunk cost of doing the KYC and they can easily go on and they understand how to buy stocks and, oh, I can buy Bitcoin as easily as buying stocks. I really do think this is profoundly important that the, the number of people who are now reachable to get an allocation to Bitcoin is probably at least a couple orders of magnitude larger than it was beforehand. Um, And it is also important to acknowledge these people are only getting one piece of the Bitcoin uh, uh, prize. They're getting the number go up technology, but they're not getting the freedom go up. So I think it is important for people to consider self-custody and and taking that financial sovereignty if they can. Yeah. Now, you've recently joined Swan, and obviously you announced this recently at uh, Pacific Bitcoin. Um, you joined the Swan Vault team. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about the Swan Vault and um, you know what's kind of the latest there? Yeah, Swan Vault is a product that makes collaborative custody uh, much easier. One of the things that's really scary about Bitcoin custody is that it's not that difficult to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, and if you imagine like the idea of keys controlling Bitcoin, imagine if you had keys to your car and you lost the keys and the car vanished from the universe and would never come back. That's what it's like to lose your keys with Bitcoin. If you lose your Bitcoin keys or you do something silly and you like leave them online or someone gets them uh, digitally, then then you're hosed. You're in deep, deep trouble. Uh, so that makes it much scarier than, you know, regular Um, financial accounts that you have at a bank where if you screw up, you just call them up and say, here's my social security number or here's my, you know, passport ID or something, give me my account back. Um, The thing that we're trying to develop at Swan is a collaborative custody solution where uh, we give you the same sovereignty that you'd have by self-custodying with a single signature or single key, um, but we provide a kind of backup. So if you lose one of your keys, we're there to help you out and uh, get your funds back to you. So it's a two of three multi-sig solution. um, And it it has all the benefits of self-sovereignty. You have two of the keys. And if you want to move the funds by yourself, you can. And Swan has no say over that. But if you do accidentally shoot yourself in the foot and you lose one of your keys, we're there to help you uh, recover your funds. Great. And so in terms of improvements in self-custody, uh, technology and maybe culture, what are you seeing there? Like, Do you think it's meaningfully getting easier for people to self-custody as the cycles go on? That's a good question. I think there uh, has been improvements, but the improvements haven't been uh, as significant as I would have hoped. And I am interested to see what Block has come out with their new uh, wallet oh, solution. Key, yeah. Bit key, yeah, because I do think Jack Dorsey has got a, a very user centric uh, mindset, and I think that if anyone is going to make self custody easy for people to do, he's someone who would be able to do that. But in general, I I don't think that 
uh, wallet solutions are quite as easy to use as I would have hoped for if you had asked me this question in 2017. Um, but yeah, it's 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 an open question a, a, about whether that's going to improve meaningfully or what's going to happen is that people are going to get access to Bitcoin through ETFs. Back to the show in a moment. This show is brought to you by CoinKite.com. CoinKite are the leading Bitcoin security hardware provider, making devices such as the cold card or the tap signer and the new cold card Q, which I've got on order. I'm waiting and I'm looking forward to that. The reason we use these hardware devices is to keep our keys offline. And as my friend NVK at CoinKite says, secure your Bitcoin like it's worth 10x what it is now because it could quickly move. And with the cold card, you can do all kinds of options in terms of how you want to secure your coins, whether you just want to keep it basic, directly plug it in, use single signature, whether you want to add an extra passphrase onto that, or whether you want to go to the next level of using multi-signature, which is a more advanced step. And so there's all kinds of options. You can find out more over at coinkites.com. You can get your cold card there. And don't forget about your metal seed backup. So they have the seed plate. You get the metal stamper and you can stamp in your 12 or 24 words. That will also help you in the case of hardware device failure. So these are some of the things to think about when we are securing our coins. But generally, you want to keep your private keys offline and in a specialized device when you need to sign Bitcoin transactions. So go to coinkite.com, use code Levera for a discount on your cold cards and gear. This show also brought to you by Nomad Capitalist. As many of you know, I left Australia for various reasons, tax as well as the COVID tyranny. But with Bitcoin's price rise, as I record this, Bitcoin's price is around 70000 It's probably time for many people to think about Plan B, citizenship and residence. And the team at Nomad Capitalist can help you strategize and then they can also help you implement that plan. And so the thing is, you've got to think about the different options. There's hundreds of countries and jurisdictions around the world. I live in Dubai, but Dubai may not be the right choice for every single person. You have to decide what is correct for you, for your family and for your business, crucially. So when you talk to the team at Nomad Capitalist, they can help you identify where you might be able to make improvements in your setup where maybe you can acquire a plan B citizenship or residence. So over at nomadcapitalist.com slash apply, you can apply to become a customer there. This service is generally suitable for people with a liquid net worth above $1 million, uh, and this is a service that uh, helps you strategize and pick the right tools uh, to help you in terms of lowering your tax legally, going offshore, being able to invest over sh- overseas. So go to nomadcapitalist.com slash apply. And now back to the show. Yeah, I think um, the challenge is, you know, there have been easy walls in the past as well, but oftentimes they were, they were making a trade-off in security somewhere. And so then the user doesn't really understand that. But at the same time, you know, I think making it easy for people to self-custody and maybe there are other elements like social recovery and things like this that are, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's also useful. Um, so, you know. Getting the balance uh, yeah. right is really, really difficult. U- user interface and handling people shooting themselves in the foot and estate planning. There are all of these different factors that you have to balance and getting that balance correct uh or not not just correct, because you could argue for balance that's um, different for different people, right? Some people really care about security, and for them, like, a three of mul- a five multi-sig spread over multiple continents is the right solution, because they have, like, a massive amount of funds un- under custody, or they're self-custodying. But then you could have people who have, say, $5,000. They're cust- self-custodying $5,000. And they want to be able to use it much more frequently. Uh, And the potential for losing the keys is higher because they're walking around with it. And so social recovery becomes more important. If you're someone developing a wallet, what you need to find is you're looking for product market fit, which is what is the right balance here, which has the biggest market share. Uh, And that's a really tough question. Uh, And I still think there needs to be more exploration of the space to figure out what, what the best product market fit is. Yeah, and I'll just point out here as well, I think there's more, let's say, awareness in the community or discussion in the community about what are the limits, how far will Bitcoin, uh, and as as it currently will, how far will it scale with current technology, current block size limit, etc. Um, because, you know, you could argue that uh, maybe it's probably limiting somewhere somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 100 million people today. And if, there's, if we're in a world with 8 billion people and 300 million 
corporate or whatever entities, then uh, you know what are the implications then? If only let's say the top ten or fifty million hodlers can realistically afford to hodl, um, I guess that also has implications on you know what's the size of the market here, right? Like it, you know it means maybe the hardware wallets and the and the custody solutions are kind of more oriented to let's say higher net worth customers, and maybe that's you know, maybe that's going to be um, the main people who are going to self-custody and other people will have to use some other kind of custodial system uh, because that's just the limits of um, Bitcoin as we have it today. And, you know, maybe that'll drive further conversation about other improvements. Maybe there's covenant technology, something that improves that. Um, but uh, I'm curious if you have any reactions on that or maybe it's, it's not something you've kind of deeply looked at. Uh, this is a huge rabbit hole, this topic, and I do have a lot of thoughts on it, and I do want to write something about this at some point, and I think my opinion is somewhat controversial. Uh, I don't know if I've ever brought this up, so this might be the first time. It's a scoop. <laughs> uh, it's a scoop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it now, uh, and then I'm going to contradict myself in a way later on. Bitcoin <laughs> is not for everyone, and, and what do I mean by that? What What I mean by that is... Not everyone will have a UTXO they control with a private key. Uh, and in fact, I think that will be exceedingly rare. Yeah. And, and the analogy I like to make is that if you go back to the 19th century when we're under a gold standard, the classical gold standard, very few people had a brick of gold. Having a UTXO is kind of the equivalent of having a brick of gold. Maybe there's a handful of people on earth who have several bricks bricks of gold but you know you actually were pretty rich if you had a few gold coins uh and you know for everyday commerce you use things which are smaller like copper or silver coins or you know then you use promissory notes on gold because you carrying around a gold coin is like a big big deal it has a lot of value um i think there's this kind of egalitarian streak that goes through the bitcoin community uh, and I sort of subscribe to Murray Rothbard's perspective that egalitarianism is a revolt against nature. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I I think it's kind of a mistake uh, to think that Bitcoin was created so that everyone in Africa could do peer to peer payments and, and have a UTXO. If that's your mindset, Bitcoin is not for you. Bitcoin's DNA will prevent that. Bitcoin's, to me, it's fundamental. Um, use case is as a new monetary base that allows for settlement between large finance, financial institutions and it allows us to put the world on a new financial base, monetary base, uh, that cannot be corrupted and cannot be inflated. And that is so much more important than this kind of small fry peer-to-peer, -peer, I want to use Bitcoin to pay for coffee or you know, some libertarians like, I really want anonymous money to pay for drugs. Those concerns, I don't want to invalidate at a local level that people care about those things, but the big picture here is if we can get the world on a new monetary base that's incorruptible, that profoundly changes the geopolitics of the world and puts us in a much, much better position. Uh, effectively puts the world back on a, you know, a super gold standard. Uh, like the 19th century when the world came out of, lifted itself out of po poverty and was the greatest creation of wealth in the history of humanity happened under a gold standard. I think that's what we want. Uh, and <clears throat> to get Bitcoin to a point where everyone could have a UTXO would require modifying it in such a way that you lose the value of Bitcoin, which is its immutability. You can't change it. It's very, very difficult to change. And this is the lesson of the block size wars. Even if you get a cabal of very powerful people in the Bitcoin community, miners and large holders and exchanges who want Bitcoin to change, they couldn't change it. And that's what makes Bitcoin special. It makes it immune to tampering. It makes it immune to you know government control. It makes it immune to increases in the sub, the inflation schedule. You can trust Bitcoin is going to do what it does, which is produce blocks basically every ten minutes, allow you to have transactions that can't be censored, and gives you uh, an inflation schedule that you can rely on. There won't be more than twenty one million bitcoins, and that is so precious. We have not had a human institution with that kind of permanence ever. Uh, so we don't want to lose that, you know, chasing coffee payments. So <clears throat> my my argument that is that Bitcoin is not for everyone, but on the other hand, it is for everyone because a new monetary base, 
a superior monetary base benefits everyone on earth. We will have a new uh, global economy where trade can happen much more seamlessly and which the, the monetary base is neutral and not political. That is a huge benefit to humanity. So on the one hand, it's not for everyone. You, not everyone's going to have a UTXO and that's okay, but it is for everyone because we're going to live in a better world. Yeah, and I think I think I I can agree with that perspective. Um, I I mean I've gone back and forth on certain ideas. Like I think I'm still potentially open to the idea of like some kind of you know low risk safe covenant soft fork that you know hopefully maybe it can enable a little bit more people you know some more people to be able to self custody. But I but I also do agree it, at the end of the day that I think eight billion people with their own UTXO is likely not feasible and i think being realistic the more realistic pathway is what like what i like what we were saying it's more like we might be living in a world where there's 10 million lightning banks lightning banks or Fedimint mint or cashew or various you know um kind of lightning banks let's call them uh just to kind of simplify it a bit and you know in that world that's still you can still leave from one bank and go to another and you know, I think there there is an element there. I guess one other point, people, and I do have an answer for this myself as well, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Some people would make the argument, oh, well, if in that world less than 1% of the, of the world can actually self-custody, is there a possibility that, you know, the 21 million cap is uh, gone at that point because they're going to do fractional reserve or, you know, not enough people can do a bank run to keep the custodians honest or... Uh, this kind of concern. Do you have a, a view on that? I think it's an interesting concern. I think the fact that it, Bitcoin is digital and can be moved much more quickly makes it harder to do fractional reserve than it, with gold in the 19th century, where gold is actually really difficult to move. So there's this huge inertia. Like when you do a deposit at the bank, it's going to stay there. It's probably going to stay there. And the banks saw that. They saw that like people didn't want to move their gold and that allowed them to sort of fractionalize a lot more. Uh, I think with Bitcoin, I, I think the fact that you can move it so quickly means that you're going to get bank runs much more quickly if you're fractionalizing. And I think that the existence of bank runs is really what creates a market kind of suppression or cap on on the growth of fractionalization. Uh, and because it will happen quickly, I think that suppression is is greater than in a system where you can't move the money as easily. Yeah, interesting. And I think the other point I would add to that, and I think I, I agree with you, the other answer I would give is that even in that world, let's say there was 10 million lightning banks, they are not necessarily going to trust each other. So they're going to need Bitcoin and Lightning to settle with each other, right? So even if you wanted to create this kind of cartelized world with, with you know, government captured banks, they're not going to trust each. Like, are they going? How are they going to trust each other? Are they just going to magically trust each other, or again, are they going to fall back to oh, Bitcoin and Lightning, you know, on chain? And so maybe at that level, that's another kind of argument there um, that suggests that the system would still be stable in terms of. Put it this way, if, I mean, put it this way, I believe there would be some people who try fractional reserve, right? Of course, there'll be people who try fraud, and of course, there will be rugs, but will that be an individual impact and not a systemic impact? That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Like maybe individuals will get wrecked or rugged, but the system would still defend the 21 million limit, you know, is, is how I'm seeing that. Yeah, I think that's completely fair, and I very frequently go back to gold as an analogy because I I think a Bitcoin standard would be very similar to a gold standard in many ways. I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin community sort of see Bitcoin as this massive, like, game-changing revolution in terms of a monetary system, and certain aspects of it are. But in other ways, it's very familiar and similar to gold. And, and I think Hal Finney understood this. He, you know, there were a lot of people in the early days of Bitcoin who were like, oh, this completely decentralizes everything and we're going to have peer-to-peer -peer payments and we're just going to use Bitcoin, that's it. Every individual is going to have Bitcoin and the fees are going to be zero. And Hal Finney's like, no, there'll be banks. <laughs> there'll still be, we need banks. Uh, and I, I, so I, what I think of is this is just a much, much superior version of the 19th century classical gold standard, which was an awesome monetary system and really brought about a lot of wealth creation in the 19th century. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of similarities there. I see, yeah. And so I guess, to me, the main concern that someone could raise is just this idea that governments might try to capture, you know, because if not enough people can self-custody, then maybe there's more of a risk of capture. But I, I suppose that's where the debate would be. And, you know, I guess the answer could also be that, look, Bitcoin is just so much better than gold that it's a lot harder to capture, especially in a, you know, in a globalized world with the internet and the possibility of millions of lightning banks in so many different countries around the world. Um, I think the political capture can go both ways. Bitcoin can capture governments too. As people start owning Bitcoin, they become advocates for it and you get politicians who own Bitcoin and, and they write legislation which becomes friendly to Bitcoin. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, in terms of full political capture. I don't think there's enough ownership of Bitcoin to say that we've got to full political capture. Uh, and I do worry about the concentration risk from the ETFs, the fact that Coinbase is custodying uh, Bitcoins for, I believe, eight of the 10 ETFs. I think that is a huge concern. Uh, we definitely need um, some... Uh, I guess more innovation. custodians and for that to Plus, decentralize more custodians. We need more competition and innovation in the custody market. Uh, and uh, I would like to see that play out hopefully in the next one or two years. I think it would be really bad if Coinbase ended up holding, say, 5 or 10% of the bit total supply of Bitcoins. That would be a real danger. Yeah, I see. And so just to nail down that exact risk, is it the risk of, let's say, a contentious fork, and let's say the government sort of says, Coinbase, we want you to go this way on the fork, and Coinbase has, at that point, let's say, 10% of the supply or something, and that'll, that gives them a certain level of extra influence over the direction of the protocol, but I guess, hypothetically, it doesn't give them full control, right? I mean, the rest of the network could still go the other way. I think it's just a centralized point of failure and that the government could lean on them in various different ways. And we may not even be able to imagine all the ways. One of them might be confiscation. Although one thing I think is really important to point out is people sometimes make the comparison to the confiscation of gold, or Executive Order 6102. It's important to understand that that was done um, in what's actually a constitutional way. The U.S., constitution has the bill of rights and one of them is you, you cannot confiscate something without just compensation like the government can't just walk around taking stuff and saying this is ours now uh the the reason they were able to confiscate gold is that gold was uh redeemable for dollars and vice versa you could take dollars and get gold and you could take gold and get paper bills as well and so the government just said hey we're giving you just compensation we know the value of a dollar is uh sorry the the value of a, a one ounce gold coin is twenty dollars so if you have a gold coin in the bank we'll give you a twenty dollar bill so in, in a way you could argue that that was constitutional and it wasn't a confiscation because the government was just paying the market price for gold um much much more difficult to go and confiscate uh bitcoin or gold now because they don't have that same constitutional trick where gold was money and there were these notes which could be redeemed at a fixed value that doesn't exist anymore you can't just easily say uh i'm going to give you a 20 dollar bill for for one bitcoin there's no fixed exchange rate to do that uh if they wanted to buy bitcoin on the open market well then that's going to be very very difficult <laughs> back to the show in a moment Mempool.space is the leading Bitcoin and blockchain visualizer. I use it all the time when it comes to checking what's happening in Bitcoin's mempool, as well as assessing things like Bitcoin's mining network, as well as looking at Bitcoin's lightning network. And they also have an upcoming accelerator program. So for those people who want to sign up for that, you can find out more at mempool.space slash accelerator. The mempool team are continually coming out with new ways to look at the chain and understand what's going on there. You can look at transactions, you can search the RBF history, the replace by fee history, and there's so many more things that the team are just continually rolling out. So you can find out more over at mempool.space. And finally, the lead sponsor of this show is Swan Bitcoin over at swan.com or using the Swan Bitcoin app available on the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You can Download Swan Bitcoin app and you can then sign up really quickly and you can buy Bitcoin. Now, there are different ways people do this. Some people like to start with a lump sum or a smash buy. And then after that, they then proceed with an automated recurring purchase plan, aka a Bitcoin savings plan. So 
These are some of the options available to you. With Swan, the idea is to create a new base of really committed Bitcoiners, and that's really part of the mission. And so education is an important part of what Swan Bitcoin is doing. There are all kinds of material and content that's being produced by the Swan Bitcoin team, whether that's Swan Signal Live or Dante's Daily Bitcoin Show or the newsletter that goes out uh, to Swan customers. Also, for those of you who are high net worth investors, check out swanprivate.com. Over at Swan Private, you'll have access to a dedicated concierge, a person you can call. They can help you with more advanced considerations, things like tax loss harvesting or support for entity accounts and additional uh, guidance around your custody setup. You can find out more over at swan.com. And now back to the show. Yeah, uh, I see. The, the, so the you don't of... see a risk there that let's say the government says, oh, VJ, we're going to give you, you know, uh, a certain price for your Bitcoin in the ETF, but actually the real market price is much higher. You know, kind of like what they do in, you know, previously in Argentina or these other countries where they have like the government rate for money and then the, the true rate and they give you, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think that's unlikely in the US at the current moment. I think we still do have a rule of law in the US and, and the US isn't really a banana republic like you'd see in South America. Not or, yet, at least. No, not yet, not yet. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I do think the Bill of Rights still has power in the US. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also fair to say that there were political differences between now and what, you know, the kind of environment that supported the US 6102, whatever it was in like 80 years, 90 years ago, whatever it was, um, that, uh, you know, they, they had a lot more control over, you know, the political system than, you know, the current uh, political, uh, the, the way things are in America, at least for now. Um, yeah, so absolutely. that's a Frank crucial Lund difference. Yeah, Franklin Roosevelt was effectively working as a dictator. He had enormous power when he was president and was able to do things like that. Uh, the political class in the U.S. has a lot less power today, and a, a lot more power is concentrated in institutions that are kind of neighboring the government, but not quite in the government, things like universities, corporations, stuff like that, um, the media as well. Uh, there might even be potentially some resistance at the state level, like one idea is to sort of have more states give the right to self-custody or the states give rights to mining and so, you know, run a, run a Bitcoin node and this kind of thing. You, I mean, we could make parallels even with um, like drug legalization, right? So it's like at, at state levels in many states in the US, as I understand, it's, you know, either legal or being decriminalized in a lot of cases. But at the federal level, you know, the federal police can't really do much about that. Yeah, that's a great example. And the U.S. system is designed in a way that you can you can make things difficult to do uh, as a dictator because there are all these sort of checks and balances, and the ju ju judicial system is one of those. So, for instance, the SEC has been blocking ETS for a really long time, and eventually they got sued for this. The judicial system can be a check as well. And you could say, well, the executive branch can do whatever it wants. It can ignore the judicial system. But actually, in practice, they don't do that. And and when the, the court system said, no, you've, your decision on ETFs has been capricious, um, they they folded and they they approved the ETF. So there are various ways, and one of them is what, what you're suggesting, where you can get these things approved at the state level and then make the federal government fight the states. And that if you have enough people arguing, basically it creates gridlock. Uh, and that's, that's a and great that could be to for, our benefit, right? Gridlock yeah, is good for us. That's <laughs> a great, great thing for people who believe, believe in personal freedom is to have the government gridlocked as much as possible. Yeah, interesting. And so, yeah, that could also be an interesting dynamic. And also, the USA is one country out of, you know, like it used to be that the USA was so dominant in terms of economically, militarily, and, it, you know, people talk about this idea of a multipolar world, right? So even if the US government manages to control Bitcoin completely, which again, I think is not going to happen, but even if it completely controlled it in the US, the US is what, 350 million people out of a population of 8 billion people? And there's a lot of wealth outside of the U.S. And so, you know, I think that is also another check on um, this kind of capture. 
The great irony, though, I find, Stefan, is that the U.S. is the friendliest to Bitcoin. There are all of these other countries I believe would benefit a lot from uh, Bitcoin emerging as a, a world reserve currency, which don't seem to understand how this would hurt the U.S. for Bitcoin to emerge. And they've actually been pretty antagonistic, like China and Russia. If they were really thinking... Uh, long term, they would see the benefits of encouraging Bitcoin adoption rather than fighting it. And the US, I think, and I wrote this in my book, has the most to lose economically and geopolitically for Bitcoin to become the global reserve currency. Yet at the same time, the US is the country which has been most favorable from a regulatory perspective towards Bitcoin. But I think that's also this kind of libertarian streak that goes through the country's history. Yeah, interesting. And so, yeah, I mean, where, where does it all land? I think one other thing you could say is that even though there are, is meant to be this kind of system of, you know, the executive, the, judici the judiciary, and the legislative as meant to theoretically keep each other in check, in practice, the, when you vote, the, you know, that party gets to choose who gets into the Supreme Court. So it's kind of like over time, they still get to influence the judiciary by putting in loyalists. So there's kind of, it kind of erodes over time, doesn't it? Yeah, that's an interesting example. I, the thing that I, I think about the Supreme Court is that there have been presidents who have appointed people to the Supreme Court hoping that they would act in a certain way, but they've been um, much more unreliable. So people put on the court who they thought would be conservative, but ended up being liberal and, and vice versa. Right. And that is one of the benefits of the creation of the, the, the structure of the Supreme Court is that the justices are appointed for life. And so they don't really answer to anyone once they're appointed. And so when they get on, that, that's when you start seeing their real real uh, views and real opinions. Yeah. Uh, so you're right, there is some influence, but I, I do think the judiciary is a system that has historically provided a good check to the government. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, I think it's a... You know, some interesting points around uh, system capture and how Bitcoin potentially captures the state back, right? Or um, it, it is decentralized enough that it survives anyway because it's a big world out there. Um, we were talking a little bit about some of the lawsuits and, you know, another thing that you've been talking about is uh, GBTC and uh, and DCG as well. And what what does it mean, right? And so... Do you want to just give us a bit of an overview? Where are your thoughts on this? Because, you know, Genesis had their bankruptcy and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what's happening with Grayscale. Uh, where are you at uh, on that for now? So there's, I mean, this is a very long story and GBTC, this uh, product which allowed people to get uh, exposure to Bitcoin prior to the ETFs, was at the heart of the collapse in 2022. Uh, and I don't think people fully appreciated how important GBTC is. It was, if you look at these bankruptcies, FTX and BlockFi and Genesis, GBTC is everywhere. Like they, they all hold GBTC. So it, it sort of became this systemic problem. Uh, and the, the story is that you had this fund which allowed people to get exposure to Bitcoin before there were ETFs, but the fund was structured in a way that it couldn't track Bitcoin properly. Um, there was no redemption mechanism that ETFs have. And in in its early history, actually most of its history, um, it traded at a big premium to the Bitcoins that it held. So if it held, uh, say, 100 Bitcoins, then the value of the fund, total value of the fund was like 150 Bitcoins worth because there was so much demand from people to get exposure to Bitcoin in traditional equity markets that they were willing to pay a premium and there was no sort of arbitrage redemption mechanism to to get the price to track properly. Um, and what happened was that it, this created an arbitrage trade where people could sort of farm the premium. Uh, and this became really big in the 2020 cycle where uh, you had these huge hedge funds. Of, like hedge, Three Arrows hedge Capital like and others. Three yeah. Arrows Capital is the, 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 the biggest one, which were just doing this arbitrage trade to make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars farming the premium. Uh, and eventually the premium kind of disappeared. It had existed through all of GBT's history, GBTC's history from 2013 up to about 2021, I believe. it dis The premium disappeared in 2021. 
And the reason it disappeared was there was more competition for things that you could get access to Bitcoin in equity accounts. Like MicroStrategy, for instance, became like a, a way to get exposure to Bitcoin if you're an equity investor. So the premium goes away, and then all of these people who are playing the premium trade start exploding. Uh, and Three Arrows Capital explodes. Uh, they were not only doing the um, GBTC premium uh, trade, but they were also doing the Terra Luna um, uh, trade as well, and, and that blew up. Then Three Arrows Capital goes under, and then it knocks over. It puts a big hole in Genesis's balance sheet. And then Genesis starts calling in loans from FTX. And then FTX becomes unstable, and then eventually it collapses as well, and then it sort of falls back on Genesis, and Genesis collapses. So these all all are tied to this GBTC product. Um, the story is much, much deeper and, and more in-depth, and I have a, a massive thread on this on Twitter. It's like my longest thread ever. It's like 45 tweets or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'll put that in the show um, notes, but go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so eventually... This thing, GBTC, gets approved uh, as an ETF. Um, the, the problem now for the issuer of GBTC, Grayscale, is that GBTC was held by all of these companies that went bankrupt, and they need to do something with it because they need to pay back their creditors. And um, some of the bankrupt estates have said, we're just going to pay people back in dollars. Regardless of what you deposited with us, whether it was Bitcoin or Ethereum or some altcoin or dollars, everyone gets dollars. And that, that means they need to liquidate their assets. And so some of these estates, like FTX, for example, took the GBTC and just sold it to dollars. And so that puts downward pressure on the market because uh, now that it's an ETF, a sale of GBTC will cause a sale on the spot market of Bitcoin. Um, then there are other bankruptcy estates like Genesis, where the goal is, um, they've said, is to not sell it to dollars, but to give back creditors, if they were a Bitcoin creditor, to give them Bitcoin back. And that obviously has huge advantages for the creditors, because then they're not getting a taxable event. Uh, and they're also, the estate keeping the Bitcoin means that as Bitcoin goes up, the estate's value goes up. Uh, so... The ETFs, when they were approved, caused a huge inflow. There was a lot of interest from retail investors to get money into Bitcoin. Now they had a way of doing so. But at the same time, you have GBTC having outflows because you have these bankruptcy estates selling. And also, they chose to have this really high management fee. GBTC chose to run as an ETF with a 1.5% yearly management fee. That's really, really high because the the rest of their competitors, the other nine ETFs are running with fees of like 0.025%. And some of them have completely eliminated the fees for the first six months or year of the existence. So GBTC stands out like a sore thumb. People who own it uh, are thinking, well, why would I own this ETF when I can own any of these other nine ETFs which have much, much lower fees. And if you have your GBTC in a tax-protected account, there's really no cost to selling it and then buying one of the other ETFs. The only natural holders of GBTC are people who held it or bought it a long time ago in a taxable account. And so they're sitting on a large taxable gain on GBTC and they're thinking, oh, I don't want to sell it because... I'd have to pay like 30, maybe 40% in taxes. I'll just eat the 1.5% in fees for, you know, however many years I want to hold my Bitcoin before I diversify. Um, that Grayscale was banking on the number of people in that situation being large. But what we've seen is actually the number of people who've re redeemed their GBTC has been massive. They started off the year with 600,000 Bitcoin Bitcoin's under management, they're down to about 300,000. Half of their fund, a huge, they were the, one of the biggest holders of Bitcoin. Half of their fund has bled out. Uh, so they have started to change their opinion on this. And uh, Michael Sonnenschein, the CEO, has come out and said, actually, we are going to reduce the fees over time. I think they're panicking. This is the sign of a company in panic mode. Like, if we don't do something about this quickly, then we're going to lose all of our assets under management. Uh, and, and the rate at which they're bleeding doesn't seem to have slowed down either. The last week has been 
you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are, are pouring out of GBTC per day. Yeah, and I'll point out as well that, uh, yes, uh, as you said, there's been this huge outflow of Bitcoins, but in one sense, they've gotten very lucky because there's been this big price rise, right? Because, like, you know, as we speak, it's about $70,000 per Bitcoin. You know, just as recently as, let's say, late 2022, it was like $16,000 a Bitcoin, right? So that massive rise has, to some extent, helped them keep a, a fiat value AUM higher than it otherwise would have been, even if their Bitcoin AUM value has come down. Now, um, the other kind of rumor, I guess, or word on the street is that, uh, you know, the DCG, the owning company or the parent company of Grayscale needs the revenue. And that's why they're sort of trying to milk this cash cow. Um, it, it, yeah, but it, it just seems, yeah, it seems odd that they kept the fee that high. Maybe, yeah, it was just kind of like, let's just milk it until milk it as long as we can until everyone leaves i, I don't know it just seems a bit um yeah it seems a bit inexplicable in that way that's my perspective i think they made a business de decision and actually i think it's probably if you think about it the rational business de decision like what what strategy do you take if you're grayscale you're good, without doubt you're going to have a, a large number of redemptions because of the bankruptcy estates uh and then you're hoping that certain people are not going to leave because they are in taxable accounts and they don't they they don't want to pay the fee. You can't really compete with um, BlackRock or Fidelity uh, in terms of uh, inflows because they have natural client bases. Fidelity is one of the largest asset managers on earth. They have this huge client base, and they can just go speak to their clients and say, "Hey, we got this Bitcoin ETF." Why don't you put some money in? Grayscale does not have that kind of connection. So they have these huge headwinds for people to want to redeem and bankruptcy estates to, to want to redeem. So reducing fees isn't really going to slow that down, I don't think, in any, any meaningful way. So even right. if they had reduced fees, they would have felt, seen the outflow. So they're like, okay, how do we make as much money from this as possible before this drops to a point where, you know, we're not going to have any assets under management. So I think they said, let's um, uh, make hay while the sun shines uh, to go with right. an old and just milk uh, it metaphor. while it's on the way down. Although well, I, I do wonder, milk, milk, yeah. I do wonder, like if they had gone to a, a rate that's competitive, right? As I understand, their competitors are, call it somewhere in that 0.2 to 0.3% range. If they had gone at least somewhere in the ballpark, would we have seen so many outflows? I don't know. I think they would have. You know, people would have said, "Oh, okay." Even if they had gone at point three five, like just a little bit above the others, that the current holders of GBTC might have said, "Eh, you know, it's not worth me leaving. I'll just, you know, you know." I I think that any amount above the competitors like BlackRock would have caused people in uh, non taxable accounts to move. Right. Because yeah. there's no friction and there's no cost to doing that. So you would have just switched over. So I don't think they could have stopped that. They couldn't have stop, stopped the bankruptcy li li uh, sort of liquidations. Um, and the problem is if they drop their fee to, say, 0.35 or 0.25 to be competitive with the other funds, then it takes them 6x longer to make that money back. Like six yeah, years. Imagine point. six years. Who knows what happens in six years? Who knows if they're they're around at all, or DCG's been sued into oblivion for its role in the Genesis bankruptcy? Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Even the market is so like uh, crazy. The Bitcoin market things have changed so much. We don't know what's going to happen in a couple of years. So I don't think that they could have tolerated that kind of runway to make the money back. I think they their thought is like let's just make as much money as we can for the next year or two. Um, and that's going to pay for like 12 years of if we had fees at 0.25%. So from a business perspective, it kind of makes sense. It just means that eventually their business is not going to be very meaningful. And they're probably going to try and sell it is my guess. Like they're going to go to someone like BlackRock and say, look, you can get all these assets under management. You can grow your, you can double your fund uh, by just buying us. And they're probably going to sell, I don't know, for a billion dollars or something like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a totally fair analysis, I think. So I guess, bottom line, zooming out, does that mean it's kind of like people are just waiting for the GBTC to sort of bleed out before, you know, the real, uh, the real crazy bull run can happen? Or what are you thinking? I think, you know, 
the rate at which it's going to bleed out is going to slow down significantly. I think the, a big chunk of the bleeding came from bankruptcy estates, and my guess is that's mostly done. Uh, or if it's not done, it's like 85% done. Uh, so I, I think the bull market's going to be unaffected from here. I think we're going to... Uh, I actually think that the bull market, like resuming kind of today, is partly because like last week I think was the last major week of redemptions. Maybe, maybe we get one more week, but I I don't think this is going to affect the bull market going forward. Yeah, so um, let's flip now to some tips and uh, common traps, I guess, like you know, I think, uh, you know, as you've been around for a while, uh, there'll be some listeners who are new. And I think it might be good to just talk through, you know, what are some common traps that people should be wary of in a bull cycle, whether it's, you know, shit coining or yield farming or trading, or I'm curious to hear what, what do you what, what would you say are the main traps that a listener should be wary of in the bull cycle? I think the underlying theme, the thing that's most important is the idea of the feeling you want to catch up. Uh, that causes all of these other problems. Like people, they get some Bitcoin and they're like, oh, well, there are all these other people who bought Bitcoin much earlier and they're up like 100% or 300% or whatever. Uh, how do I catch up to them? I can catch up if I get into a shit coin which is going up 1,000%. Uh, or I can I can do some yield farming strategy. Or they just go out on the risk curve is what people do because they feel like they need to catch up. And they they do the sort of high time preference thing, which is I, I'll do something which sounds really good, it's super risky, uh, but it'll let me get to my goals much more quickly, rather than the hard responsible thing, which is get good money, save it diligently, DCA, um, all of those kind of things kind of are boring when when you when you explain them to people. Um, so they just take on more risk than they should, and, and that that manifests itself in lots of different ways. Shit coining is probably the biggest one, and then um, doing these DeFi things and and lending, um, giving your Bitcoin away to these third party custodians who have some strategy that they they tell you is going to make you rich. All of these things are, are a bad idea. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, also, I think. There might be an element to which people overpay in certain things. Like as an example, what we traditionally see in the mining world is there's a sweet spot time to buy Bitcoin mining rigs. And usually that's in like the bottom of the bear cycle, right? Like late 2022, nobody wants to buy these Bitcoin mining rigs. There's a ton of them for sale. They're so cheap. That's like the sweet spot time to buy mining rigs. And then usually what happens in the bull run is hash price goes on a bull run as well. And so people end up really overpaying for the mining rigs. So I'm, curi- so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that or um, wh- whether you see that as kind of like a trap that people run into or um, maybe even people buying, trying to buy mining stock instead of buying Bitcoin, right? Like maybe that's another one that people can uh, yeah, fall this into. Yeah, this is a great one because it takes me back a long time to before, before um, I knew about Bitcoin when I was a gold bug. And I used to explain to people who were interested in gold, they they would go down this mining rabbit hole as well. They'd be like, well, why don't I buy miners? They seem to go up faster than gold. And I said, well, there are all these other risks to mining, gold mining in particular. There's geopolitical risks, there's management risk, there's, um, you know, the, the financial risk of managing the gold and knowing when to sell it and when not to sell it. There are way more risks to mining than if you if you're bullish on the underlying commodity, just buy the underlying commodity, and that's the same for Bitcoin mining too. There are all kinds of risks, and mining Bitcoin mining I think is even more cutthroat than gold mining uh, because of the difficulty adjustment. Bitcoin as a system makes um, Bitcoin mining one of the most difficult. Um, competitive free markets out there and the halving is you know for most of us it's an exciting event for, for miners it's a terrifying event imagine you're a miner and suddenly the the amount of revenue you're getting gets cut in half every four years um and and you need to be on top of your game in terms of costs management uh efficiency all of the all of these things have to be really nailed down otherwise you're going to be killed because someone else is going to come along and do those things better than you so I would say stay away from miners and, and generally stay away from trading, trying to find the right price point. Some people get killed not through shitcoining, but by just trying to trade Bitcoin. Like, 
oh, it's gone up a certain amount, so I should sell out and wait till it goes down, and I'll buy back in and I'll have more Bitcoin that way. Uh, the the problem with doing that is, first, the friction of taxation. If you live in a place where you get taxed for sales, the friction is so high, there's no way you can beat the system. There's just no way. It, it's it's too high. Even if you time it perfectly, you're not going to come out ahead. Um, but even if you live in an in a area where you're not taxed, it is so hard to predict. And I've seen people who have sold their Bitcoin in anticipation it's going to drop to a certain level to buy back in. And it doesn't. And it goes on a run. And they feel so disappointed because they lost the opportunity of being in the market, as you said earlier on, um, being in the market during those few days when it went on a, on a big run. So trading in and out, I think, is really dangerous. Using leverage is incredibly dangerous. There are so many people who have been blown out, who had like large Bitcoin positions and then just leveraged them. And because of that, they got margin called on a bad trade and then they lost all of their Bitcoins. Um, the only thing that's really safe is to hodl, just hodl and 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 uh just survive the game is survive as long as possible it is so hard there are so many temptations and so many people who say ah oh, you can make a bit of money here or you could do this strategy with bitcoin or there's this altcoin or maybe try mining all temptations that are trying to take your bitcoin away from you get into a zen state put your bitcoins in cold storage and be patient and you will be rewarded greatly you'll be rewarded much more than 99.9% .9 of traders who are trying to do this super smart strategy and beat Bitcoin. Uh, that's that's the dirty secret, is that people who do the simplest, dumbest, most boring thing beat almost everyone else. Yeah, that's a fantastic way to put it. I guess one other point around um, dealing with corrections on the way up, right? And that's this is something we've seen in past cycles as well. Maybe it goes 20 or 30% dips, but it's still kind of on the way out. Do you have any tips for people to, let's say, not get shaken out? I think um, just having a DCA mindset, it really helps a lot. Because when you see dips and you're, you're a person who DCAs, you actually get excited. <laughs> you have a very different feeling to someone who's gone all in at some price uh, and, and is doing it as a trade. So if you have a DCA mindset, I think you're probably not going to be worried. And uh, and know that the cycle is probably going to end at some point. And um, if if the amount of Bitcoin you're talking about isn't like going to change your life now, you just need to have patience. I think it will change your life eventually, and you just need to focus on getting as much as possible while the getting is good. And the getting is still good. We're still at a, such an early stage of adoption. Um you know, the gold became the global reserve currency in in the 19th century, but this is like we're still in the Middle Ages for Bitcoin. <laughs> There's still this like long runway of accumulation that needs to happen before Bitcoin becomes a reserve currency. Yeah. And as we stand now, I mean, people throw around different numbers. This is like 100 million people or 200 million people, but this kind of counts, you know, quote unquote crypto and custodial accounts on various exchanges. If you had to kind of guess... How many people actually hold a serious amount of Bitcoin on chain in their own hardware wallet or multi-sig? Where where do you think that kind of number is? Like, do you think that's kind of in the single digit millions, 10 million, 20 million? What do yeah, you think? yeah, exactly. My my ballpark is somewhere between five and 20 million. Yeah. Um, it depends on how you define what significant is, but it's not, it's still a minuscule fraction of the world's population. Right. And that's, you know, five to 20 million in a population of 8 billion people. <laughs> and, you know, not every millionaire can have one Bitcoin, right? So that just shows you just how scarce it really is. Um, and so, you know, things will really change very quickly once, uh, you know, the herd comes. And I think we're still before the, the, real, the real herd rushing moment. So, uh, yeah, thanks for your insights. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's a great spot to finish there. But, uh, is there any other anything else you really wanted to mention before we close out for this episode? Um, I, I am a believer that the ETFs are game changing because it really um, unlocks the gates from the tradfi world and g gives this huge liquidity channel. I think Bitcoin's price is really strongly related to the the size and the stability of the liquidity channels into Bitcoin. In the early days, the liquidity channels were terrible. Like the first liquidity, major liquidity channel was Mt. Gox. It was very poorly run. 
a bunch of bitcoins, hundreds of thousands of bitcoins were stolen from it. But at each stage, as you got new players, say so more reliable like Coinbase, the liquidity increased and allowed US buyers to get into Bitcoin more easily. Um, and then um, then you get the ETFs, which I think are a huge, huge step up. Uh, I, I think that the size of the cohort that's reachable in this cycle is just massive. Uh, so I'm super excited for this bull market. And the fact that the prior bull market was really muted for various reasons because of the bankruptcies and the Federal Reserve. And now the Federal Reserve, instead of being a headwind, I think is going to be a tailwind. There's so many reasons I'm excited about this particular bull market. And I'm I'm really curious to see how this one plays out. Well, uh, listeners, you heard it from VJ. Make sure you hodl. And uh, thank you, VJ, for joining me. Thanks, Stefan. I hope you enjoyed the show. Get the show notes at stefanlevera.com. Thanks, and I'll see you in the Citadels.